Since 1953, WJBF Channel 6 has produced and aired some of the most popular local television shows in the CSRA. Some were for children, some were spiritual, some informative, and others just plain entertaining. From 1957 to 1973, Top Ten Dance Party aired on Saturday afternoons. For 16 years, teenagers would tune in to learn about the latest dance moves and watch a dance contest. One of the most well-known hosts of the show was Georgia Cunningham. She was a dancer on the show and was named Best Dancer of the Year. In 1963, she became a host at just 19 years old and hosted until the show ended 10 years later. Georgia was a part of the Top Ten Dance Party reunion show in 2003. On September 14th of this year, Georgia passed away at home. In 1954, a new variety show began airing on WJBF called Today in Dixie. It starred Jack Wideman and the legendary Flo Carter. They sang and danced and performed skits for an hour every weekday starting at noon. Flo says she was discovered while working at a diner called Snappy's after her husband was laid off. One day, two local TV personalities, Jim Armistad and Lou Stratton, came in for lunch, and she says the rest is history. And Jim Armistad asked me that day, he said, what do you do? I said, I sing. And he said, well, why don't you come over to Channel 6? He said, I have a show called Talent Parade, and uh, I'd like you to sing on there. So when I went over there and sang on his program, uh, Jack Wiedemann, who was a producer of Today in Dixie on Channel 6, called uh, Jim and asked him to send me over there. Flo says she made about $25 a week on the show. Today, that would be around $285. Flo explained that Today in Dixie was huge during its day. And it was shown every day on television sets around town. Things in Augusta, Georgia shut down at 12 o'clock because they were going to go out and watch the TV set. If you didn't have one, you'd go and watch it in the storefront window. Performing wasn't the only thing Flo did on Today in Dixie. I was the cook on a Friday. I was uh, sponsored by Lombard's Meal, and I cooked the fish and all the trimmings that went with it for the show. And uh, the uh, camera crew would all, all be standing out in front waiting till I got through, and we had a wonderful time on Friday. Flo tells me that eventually Jack became very busy and she began looking for a new singing partner. A young Jim Neighbors, best known for his role as Gomer Pyle on The Andy Griffith Show, came in to audition. He got the job and was there for about a year and a half before moving on to Hollywood. Oh, he was a, he was a dream. I loved Jim. I, he was, there wasn't anything he, he couldn't do. One of Flo's favorite comedy skits involved Neighbors. We were going to have a jungle and he was going to be my uh, a uh, suitor, but I had left him, and my name was Chloe. So I was crawling across the stage, and Jim was standing there with a pair of overalls, and our uh, jungle was one tree. <laughs> we couldn't afford anything. We had one tree. So when I crawled over to Jimmy Neighbors, and he was singing, Chloe, like that. And when he did that last note, I pulled his pants down, and, <laughs> and the overalls came down on the floor, and I can't remember what his shorts look like, but I tell you what, they, we went off the air real quick right then. Flo says the hosts were big local celebrities, and even WJBF's founder, J.B. Fuqua, and his wife, Dorothy, were fans. And that, that was a plus for me, so I think I told you that Dorothy uh, sent fan letters to Jack about the show. It was sweet. It was so sweet. <laughs> we felt like really special people, Kim. Flo left today in Dixie to have a baby, but that wasn't the end of her time at WJBF. She hosted a long-running gospel show featuring her family band, Sounds of Joy. They said I'd never get away from all that's in they my were also longtime guests on Parade of Quartets. She went on to have a rich career as a singer despite a medical condition that caused her to lose her voice for nine years. She's a Georgia Music Hall of Famer and toured with Sounds of Joy, eventually making a music video. WJBF had several programs for kids in those early days. Buona John was one of them. It aired every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. and followed a jungle explorer. It was hosted by John Raddick, who started at the station as a salesman and later became general manager and president. Perhaps the most famous local kids show was Trooper Terry, which ran from 1962 to 1982. It was hosted by beloved personality Terry Sams. The show had a live studio audience full of children. Over 20 years, more than 100,000 children appeared on Trooper Terry. Julie Bush was one of them. On Saturdays, you'd get up, and that would be one of the shows that you watched. 
he'd come on and interview people and show cartoons and we'd watch it every Saturday. That's what you did on Saturday morning. Children would sometimes have their birthday parties on Trooper Terry. Bush attended several of them and was on the show about six times. One of the things she remembers most are the contests. Every time I went, I won because I'm full of hot air and <laughs> it was a bubblegum blowing contest and it, he gave out Bazooka Joe and if you remember Bazooka Joe, it was a little square of gum that was hard <laughs> and you had to break it down and be the first one to blow a bubble. And if you did, you want a loaf of colonial bread. Oh. Now Bush didn't have any Bazooka Joe, but she came prepared with a pack of Hubba Bubba and challenged me to a contest. It might have been her first loss because I am also full of hot air. Terry Sams held many other positions at WJBF, including weatherman, vice president, and general manager. And at one time, he was part owner of the station. Jenny Montgomery has fond memories of Terry. Terry had the most booming voice, and whenever, whenever Terry was in the building, if I turned down the hallway, it'd be like, ladies and gentlemen, Jenny Montgomery. Jenny tells me Terry was Trooper Terry to everyone, some people even flagging him down if law enforcement was actually needed, but she says he loved it. Terry loved television, Terry loved his community, and he loved that even as he was retired, people still referred to him as Trooper Terry. In 2013, Terry hosted a Trooper Terry reunion special and everyone in the audience was on his show as a child. Terry Sands died in April of 2014. Bush explained that his daughter married a college friend of hers and it made her look at him in a new light. Uh, it's just neat to, you know, feel the connection and realize he was just a normal man, you know. He was a star to us because we knew him as Trooper Terry, but here was this young lady who had a da had dad who was this superstar to all of her friends. She says Trooper Terry was a hero to hundreds of thousands of kids who grew up watching him. Thank you so much for just giving us an opportunity to feel important, to be on TV, you know, I mean, because TV was so, still so new, and uh, it was just so much fun. For nearly 40 years, WJBF produced and aired a bluegrass gospel program with the Lewis family from Lincolnton. Known as the first family of bluegrass gospel music, the Lewises appeared weekly and were picked up in syndication in other markets. The Lewis family had to leave the show because their popularity grew and they toured all over the country, playing at famous venues like the Lincoln Center and the Grand Ole Opry. They continued to film Christmas specials for WJBF for a long time. They're members of the Georgia Music Hall of Fame, the Gospel Music Hall of Fame, the International Bluegrass Music Hall of Fame, and the Blue Ridge Music Hall of Fame. WJBF has the distinction of airing the longest continuously running gospel show in the United States, the Parade of Quartets. It was originally a radio show on WGAC. The show moved to WJBF and first aired on TV in 1954, hosted by Steve Manderson. It aired for two and a half hours every Sunday morning, featuring African-American gospel groups. Reverend Carlton Howard is the show's current host. He says that at the time, it was very commercial. The groups, when they came on, they had to have a sponsor. And their sponsor, they would advertise their sponsor verbally and with mentions. When Parade of Quartets began airing, it was the height of the Jim Crow era. Having a show on air geared towards African Americans in the South at that time could have spelled doom for WJBF. Carlton says, as far as he knows, there was very little backlash. He had the chance to ask J.B. Fuqua about it and was surprised by his answer. The dad told me, don't ask the question, but I said, no, I'm here, I need to know. And I asked him point blank, I said, get to in 1953, why would you put a black program on television in that, in that era? His, his, his exact words, because it was the right thing to do. Carlton tells me that when Manderson retired, his father, Henry Howard, took over the hosting gig. Henry was a regular on the show as lead singer of the Spirits of Harmony. It was almost shocking, almost like I had, as it was for me. It was like he had like a two-week notice if we wanted the program to go on or uh, somebody had to host and they asked him to do it. Parade of Quartets changed quite a bit under Henry's leadership. Back then it was more it was more entertainment than ministry and my father being a deacon and all of that stuff at church he wanted the he wanted to be more ministry oriented. Carlton's beginnings as host of the show are almost comical. He had no interest in being part of the show until one day when he was given very little choice. Henry's mother had died and he was trying to take care of funeral arrangements. He was able to find a guest host, but it didn't go as planned. But about 11 o'clock Saturday night, my dad called me and said, look, this guy said he can't do it. 
you got to go on television. I had been in the television station one time in my life. Carlton says that even though his dad wasn't in the station that day, he still controlled the show from home. He was on the telephone with Steve Griner for the whole two hours telling me to stop rocking. Said, Do you have another shirt? That shirt looked like it has a wrinkle in it. Carlton ultimately stayed and co-hosted the show with Henry until his retirement. The show has had several co-hosts like Robert Flash Gordon and Betty Griffin. Famous musicians and political leaders like Reverend Jesse Jackson and the godfather of soul himself, James Brown, were guests on Parade of Quartets. Carlton laughs when he remembers how James Brown came on the show. Uh, that was one morning that we were, we were getting ready and we normally have everything written out, how everything is going to be planned or what's going to happen that morning. And we, all of a sudden, a bus was on the outside in the parking lot. It was James Brown. And he came in prepared, wanting to, to sing and, uh, and, and perform. When somebody came to you and said, James Brown is here and he wants to perform this morning, mm -hmm. what was your reaction? Daddy, you got to guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to the break room. <laughs> yeah. Flo Carter and her family band Sounds of Joy wore monthly guests on Parade of Quartets for decades. She says it has been an honor to be a part of the show for so long. Parade of Quartets has been a big part of the CSRA community for nearly 70 years, and Flo thinks there's a reason for that. But I watch it every Sunday night, that's why. It's just, uh, it's real. The people are real, you know. You will watch a show where the people are real. Though most of these shows are nothing more than a memory, WJBF continues with its commitment to quality local television. One of our current shows is The Means Report. It started when Bob Young was an anchor at WJBF as The Young Report. When Brad Means took over Bob's seat in 1998, he also took over hosting the show. It was The Young Report, as you mentioned, when we began. Then it became The Augusta Report after they hired me. And finally, I went to our programming director, Georgia Broadcasting Hall of Fame member Mary Jones, and said, Mary, could we call this the means report at this point instead of the Augusta report? She said yes. Brad tells me that on the means report, he's able to take a deeper dive into the big topics the than there's time for on a newscast. Honest conversation, getting the answers that impact your life. One and we've always tried to focus on issues and people that shape our community. So Kim, if something is in the headlines, if it's our top story at six o'clock, chances are you'll find out more about it on the means report. Brad dreamed of being a journalist since childhood, where he and his brother acted out newscasts for their neighborhood. A graduate of the University of Alabama, he says that some of the stories he covered before he came to WJBF in 1998 shaped him. One of them gained national attention, which Brad says was a bit overwhelming for a new journalist. Probably the most impactful story I ever did was when I got called into work one Friday morning many years ago. I was working in Florence, South Carolina. At the time, my news director sent me up the road because a man's body had been been found and the body had been cremated and there was going to be some controversy. So I went and was the first person to meet with the coroner who oversaw the cremation and it turns out the body was that of Michael Jordan's father, James Jordan. Brad takes his responsibility to the community as both an anchor and host of the Means Report very seriously. No means report is ever the same as the one before. And that opportunity to kind of hit the reset button every week keeps me going. Because I think as people, we always want to learn and grow, right? My guests on the means report allow me to do that. I feel like I'm better informed and know a lot more about our community. Another popular show we air is Jenny, hosted by evening anchor Jenny Montgomery. Jenny started at WJBF in 1995 as a video editor. Before long, she worked her way to fill in anchor before taking the seat next to Bob Young in 1997. Seven years ago, leadership at WJBF decided it was time to start a new show. The idea was a, a show focusing on women's issues, family. It's expanded. It's a lot more than that now. Like Brad, Jenny feels her show allows her to really dig into more of the story and get to know the community better. Over the years, Jenny has featured artists, designers, and women's health professionals, among many. I asked her who her dream guest is, and she replied, I've already had him. Gene Hovanelli. I, I had Gene Hovanelli here in the studio. <laughs> So were you starstruck? And that was, out? well, I mean, since I was 15 years old, Gino Vanelli has been my favorite singer ever and my favorite musician. And um, so to actually have Gino here, yeah, that was, it was just, tr it was tremendous. Most journalists have a type of story they really enjoy writing about. Jenny is no different. I love 
my, my stories that I've done with astronauts. There was a time when, when there was a NASA collaboration with Fort Discovery, when it was down on the river, when we had the Fort Discovery Science Center. And um, I had an opportunity to interview Bob Ballard, who found the Titanic. Jenny says she feels like being a journalist is what she was put on the earth to do, but in another life, she may have been an English teacher. I, I really like writing, and I really, really like grammar. <laughs> and I like to help people with grammar. <laughs> Jenny hopes to continue her show for a long time and has some ideas for how it can evolve into something even better. If I could do anything with it, I would like to have um, a studio audience. I wish it could be a live show um, or at least taped with a studio audience. I would like to have questions. I would like to have people who want to ask questions too. We can't forget about our other programs, The Dish and Local Living, hosted by Anna Christina, our newest show, Your Hometown Road Trip, hosted by Brandon Dawson, and of course, the cooking show, Very Vera, which is syndicated in 25 markets. With a history like this, you can be sure WJBF will continue to produce quality local television shows for a long time to come. Be sure to tune in next month for the final installment of this four-part series honoring WJBF's 70 years on the air. And that's just part of our hometown history. In Augusta, Kim Vickers, WJBF News Channel 6.